the throne and the Lamb. And we'll be reading from chapters 4 and 5 of the book of Revelation. So Revelation chapters 4 and 5. So please turn there and we'll read together. Revelation chapter 4 verse 1. After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet, speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you the things which must take place after this. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he who sat was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance, and there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. Around the throne were twenty-four thrones. And on the thrones I saw twenty-four elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal. In the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures, full of eyes in the front and in the back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second living creature like a calf, the third living creature had a face like a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around, the, around and within. And they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the twenty-four elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honour and power, for you created all things, and by you, by your will they exist and were created. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside, and on the back sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much, because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne, and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as though it had been slain having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and you have redeemed us to God by your blood. Out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. And then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around, around the throne, the living creatures, the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and, 10, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honour and, and blessing. Strength and honour and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as, such as are in the sea and all that, in, all that are in them, I heard saying, Blessing and honour and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Then the four living creatures said, Amen. And the twenty-four elders fell down and worshipped him who lives forever and ever. We took several weeks to go through the seven churches in chapter 2 and chapter 3, and we decided to continue on with the book of Revelation, so we come to chapter 4 and chapter 5 today. It's a bit hard to pinpoint the exact time when John is referring to in these two chapters, other than the fact that he's shown this vision straight after the seven churches. But we can see that this is happening sometime after these seven churches. The Lord says to John, Come up here and I will show you things which must take place after this. So this, in fact, this is in fact um, the future events. These are the things that will happen 
after the church period. And obviously, this is about the future. When you think about future, what words come to your mind? Especially in times like this, when you think about the future, words like uncertainty, perhaps even anxiety or anxious, concerned, worried, even fearful might come to your mind. But instead, we can also think about more positive words like optimistic, joyful, hopeful, even expectant of the future or looking forward to the future. We'd like to do that, but it seems that the world is not really giving us a bright future. You know, if you look at the gospel, the gospel is good news. But before the good news comes to an individual, the bad news must come first about sin and judgment. And only when you realize that you are under the judgment of God do you truly understand and appreciate the nature of the good news, that you can be delivered from that, saved from that eternal judgment. It seems that the world history is in much the same way. It is kind of getting worse and worse and we have a very bleak and dark future. But eventually we know that the eternal world will come, that eternal future is good and bright, but it seems more imminent future is not so bright, not so optimistic, but it is somewhat gloomy and even frightening, especially as you read through the book of Revelation. And we'll see some of that in coming weeks. But today, even before John tells us about these future plagues and disasters and all these terrible things that will happen, he sets us a kind of a foundation before he tells us about those things. As we go through these terrible judgments, one consolation is that there's no mention of the church. In other words, the church seems that uh, it seems that the church is not part of or the recipient of these terrible plagues. Believers, it seems, have been taken away through rapture. Yes, there are some believers during the tribulation, those Jewish people and some multitudes who may get saved, but the churches that exist now before the tribulation are no longer in this tribulation. So, you can be sure that if you are part of the church now, then before all these plagues take place, that we will be with the Lord Jesus Christ and will have been raptured up. So at least the church will not go through the tribulation. But even then, what does the future tell us? What does the Bible revelation tell us about the future? And how does that impact us now? That's something that we can look to because that's more relevant and it is um, relevant, relevant to us now, as, even as we kind of look at those events as future events that haven't taken place yet. And before the Lord shows John about these future and these events, he, he shows something else to John, and that's what we see in chapter 4 and chapter 5. Now, now this will put some tremendous peace and ease in our hearts as it did with John. Now, what is it? What is it? We can kind of summarize it as one. It is none other than the very Lord Jesus Christ who sovereignly rules the future of the world. If you can kind of um, recollect what we have just read, chapter 4 and chapter 5, you will see that it's not so much what's happening. It's what John sees. John is taken up to heaven and he sees from the, the heaven's vantage point about the throne and someone who is sitting on the throne, God, and also the Lamb, Jesus Christ, who comes and takes the scroll. So it's all happening before the throne of God. Uh, nothing's really happening yet uh, in this world. And John sees that um, the Lamb is worthy to open the seal, open the scroll, and, and lose the seal, which kind of comes after in chapter 6. It'll make more sense as we go through these two chapters. Now look at chapter 4, verse 1. So we begin with verse 1. Now John says this, after these things, you'll see this expression many times in Revelation. Whenever he says, after these things, 
You have to understand that this is John's own personal chronology. In other words, this is basically John saying, I saw the seven churches, and after these things, I now saw these things. It's not necessarily the chronological order of the events. It is the chronology of John shown these visions. It also means that after these things also means that this is a change of scene. It's almost like moving from scene to scene. And John is now taken up to heaven. He says, I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. So the door is open and John is called to enter into that gate into heaven. And the voice which I heard was like a trumpet, like a trumpet, meaning just very loud sound, speaking with me, saying, come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. Now, also, uh, you have to understand that this doesn't happen that often. John saw heaven. It looks like Paul also saw heaven. Maybe there are some Old Testament characters who are taken up to heaven alive, but there aren't that many people who have actually been to heaven or seen heaven. Although there are people who might actually say um, otherwise. Um, you know, we need to take them and their testimonies very care carefully because there are all kinds of claims that they have been to heaven or hell and seen these places. Um, and it may sound convincing, but you've always, you always have to compare it against the Bible. Now, that reminds me of my own experience. When I was in a, another church many, many years ago before I got saved, I was in a church and we invited a guest speaker from um, America. And he was an American and he was speaking about his own experience. And his testimony or his um, um, uh, seminar was very popular. The whole church was, was full. There were hundreds of people, people from the church that I was attending and people from also other churches. And he was basically telling us about what it was like in heaven. And you might come across these kind of claims quite commonly amongst some circles. He said things like Jesus was building some mansions, apartments, and some mansions are better than others, and it all depends on how you live now. And um, heaven is almost like a, a literally a kind of city where um, everything's really good and, and wonderful. He talked about some things from Revelation, saying that the pavement was gold and, and diamond and things like that. You know, they kind of sounds like, so, sounded like from the Bible, but there were much that was not from the Bible. But people came to listen to that. The funny thing was, after about three or four months um, after he had come to the church and then you know, went, went away, um, the pastor of the church actually um, gave a special announcement. And it was quite embarrassing because he had to say that the speaker who came to talk about heaven was a hoax. So he had to tell us that so and so speaker who came about three months ago, who told us about heaven, now he, um, is found, he was found to be a fraud and he was in some sort of trouble with the law and um, he basically told us that, you know, to, to disregard everything that we have heard from that speaker. I, I thought that was quite amusing and it was quite um, disappointing on the one hand. And I realized that you always have to go back to the Bible and compare it against the Bible. You can go to the bookshop and find a number of books that also write about personal experiences of going to heaven. Um, still, you've got to compare the claims against the Bible. And um, if you look at the Bible, these kind of occurrences do not happen that often. The only handful of few people, um, Paul and John, who talked about this. And when you look at Paul's testimony, he said in 2 Corinthians that yes, I have, he even used third person pronoun, as you know. He said, I know someone who has been to heaven, referring to himself. And he was kind of going to talk about that a little bit, but he said, I just could not express with words, so I will stop here. He refused to talk about his experience, lest he would give some incorrect information or some sort of speculation to the people. Because by um, divine inspiration, John was able to write down what he saw. Things that he saw that we read about here are out of this world. Now, th there are a lot of symbolisms, and we've got to discern whether something's symbolism and something's literal. And that becomes rather quite you know, simple and e easy. It's not that complicated. It's true there are things that we still cannot understand fully and clearly, but most things are discernible and understandable 
um, if you just apply normal rules of hermeneutics, understanding, interpreting the scripture. So he says, after these things, I went up to heaven, and the Lord said, I will show you things which must take place after this. Let's just read through. Verse 2. Immediately, I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. The word throne appears many times in this chapter. And first of all, he sees the throne. And there is one who is sitting on the throne. And of course, this one who sits on the throne is God. And this throne is the throne of God. This is what he sees first. Now, what does that mean? Throne and God's throne, God sitting on it. Um, he simply describes who, uh, what God was like in verse 3. And he who sat there was like a jasper, like a diamond clear um, gemstone. And sardius, um, kind of ruby red kind of um, stone. And in appearance, and there was like a rainbow around the throne. In appearance like an emerald. It's kind of cool greenish kind of gemstone here again. Now you notice that he doesn't really describe the actual physical appearance of God because you cannot see God. No one can see God with physical eyes, and he's not describable in physical appearance. You can only describe, I suppose, an after effect of seeing God or how he manifests himself to us. And here, John is um, only able to describe him as some gemstones with clear color, red and emerald and rainbow around the throne. It seems that he's seeing the light that is shining from God around the throne, and he's describing that using all these um, jewels. But the fact that he is now sitting on the throne means something. And when you think about throne, what comes to your mind? Throne is basically a chair. It's not just a normal chair. If you have seen a kind of throne, the throne is uh, a chair that's uh, made and designed for the royalty like kings and queens and princes and princesses. And these thrones are usually placed on high podium or platform or stage. And they usually sit there because they go to work. Now sitting on the throne is not resting. When a king is sitting on a throne, the king is there to judge or to hear the matter or to make decisions or to discuss matters of the king kingdom with his ministers. Throne means that the king is ruling. It's almost like the judge sitting in the judge's seat and you say the court is in session. The court goes to work. The king sits on the throne and the king goes to work. And that means that the king is actively involved in ruling. In this case, this throne is the throne of God. And God is sitting on a throne, which means that he's not passive. It's not just resting. It's not something to, to be associated with comfort. But the king is sitting on the throne because he's actively ruling this world. And what does that mean? Now, we will find out that as we read through chapter 6 and 7 and 8, all the way to chapter 19, you will basically read all these stories of terrible chaos, or it seems like chaos. Things are happening, some plagues, diseases, maybe wars, and things are falling from the sky, and people are dying, and the river is turning into blood, and um, all these creatures are dying, and it seems like the, the world is falling apart. At best, that is a terrible chaos and utter massive destruction. Before we get to that, the Lord is making sure that John and, and we understand that this is not out of control situation. The king is sitting on his throne. The king, our Lord God, is in control of the world. It's not happening because he is not controlling this world. It's happening exactly the opposite because God is in control and ruling this world. So God sitting on the throne is... God is actively engaged in rule, in ruling this world, even when the world is going through some worst, disastrous, chaotic times. Disasters don't happen because God, is, God has lost his control, but 
it is precisely the opposite. Because God is in control, they happen. And that's quite a comforting thought, even in our time now, isn't it? I mean, the world is suffering from this coronavirus, and many nations are embracing for what is um, yet to come. And we feel very insecure sometimes. We feel somewhat fearful. Uh, we feel uncertain, you know, what's going to happen, how long is this going to last. Um, even if this comes, to, uh, comes under control, what happens next? What if something worse um, comes after that, which is quite likely? Now, we can lose sense of security and peace because of that if you look to the future. But as Christians, we know that God is in control. We know that it is because God is in control and He rules this world, these things happen. If anything, God is allowing these things so that people would turn to the Lord God and know that there's nothing concrete or nothing secure in this world that they can trust but they have to turn to the Lord God. So God is in his throne, sitting on his throne. So John sees that as the very first thing. And the way he describes God in chapter 4, verse 3, is just um, beyond words. And this, is just, this has to be just very beautiful. All these gemstones, clear diamond like jasper and sardius, ruby red, and greenish emerald with all kinds of rainbow color around the throne. Although he could not see God, he saw the effects or his presence, God's presence um, around the throne. And then, if you look at verse 4, around the throne were 24 thrones. Now, not just one, but now 24 thrones. And on the thrones, these thrones, I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes. And they had crowns of gold on their heads. Now these are all symbolic. 24 elders. First of all, um, before talking about who they are, let's have a look at what they look like. Clothed in white robes. Remember that um, as we looked at Three, the, the seven churches in, in chapter 2 and chapter 3, we saw that the white robes represent salvation, um, garments of salvation, rope of justification, righteousness. So these are people who are saved, now sitting together with God on the thrones. In fact, they have crowns, meaning that they are like kings. And they're also on the thrones, which means that they're also ruling, involved with God in ruling the world. And that sounds like they are kings. There is the king, and they are the kings. Remember the expression, king of kings, lord of lords? God is king and lord, and Christians, his people, are royal priesthood. They are, we are, the kings. Look at, jump to chapter 5, look at verse 10. Look at verse 10. It says, God has made, he, you have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. So these 24 elders are saved people who are ruling with God on the thrones together with God. So why the 24, and who exactly are they then? Um, well, it doesn't say explicitly here. Now, there are many speculations and many um, propositions uh, or proposals as, as to who they are. But um, it's safe to say that these represent Christians. And the number 24 possibly could refer to uh, 12 of the New Testament, 12 apostles, and maybe even 12 tribes. Not specifically, not, not, spe not directly the Jewish people, because Israel as a nation has not been saved until this point in time but the 12 from the Old Testament tribes and 12 from the New Testament apostles. Um, that seemed to make sense. You know, 24 elders, um, those who lead and represent the churches, um, both from the Old Testament and from, from the New Testament, the church that has been raptured up and the church that is together with the Lord Jesus Christ, that they are ruling the world. In fact, um, the Bible tells us, as we will go through in, in coming weeks, that Christians will come together into this world during the Millennium Kingdom and we will rule on earth together with Christ um, as kings. 
So these 24 elders most likely represent church or Christians who are ruling together with God. Look at verse 5. And from the throne, now this is the throne, not the thrones, but the throne on which God sits, proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. What does that remind you of? That reminds you of the Mount Zion, when God came down to the mountain before the people of Israel, when God was present and speaking to the people, it sounded like thunders, and there was lightning, and there was cloud, and darkness. So this certainly is the presence of God, and it says also voices, which means that God is now speaking. God is speaking to them, and God comes to us through his words. So this is also with God's presence, his rule, and the church are involved in ruling the world. And he says, also seven lambs of, the, of fire were burning before the throne. So there are seven lambs burning before the throne of God, which are, now here is the, the interpretation of that, um, which are the seven spirits of God. Now seven spirits doesn't mean that there are seven individual spirits of God. There's only one spirit of God. But as we saw before, sevenfold spirits. Turn to chapter 1. We talked about that before, so let's just have a look at it and just um, skim through quickly. In verse 4, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from whom, him who is and was and who is, to, who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. Seven spirits before his throne, same thing. So the Lord is um, depicted as the sevenfold spirits, seven, the number meaning perfection. So God is spirit. Um, and seven spirits of God is simply the spirit of God, not seven individuals, but one spirit who comes as a kind of seven, with seven perspectives or sevenfold spirit. So you have the throne, God sits there, he is ruling, the church is there, and the spirit of God is there as well. And verse 6, let's have a look at verse 6. He says, before the throne there was a sea of glass. Like crystal. Now, this is not literal water sea, sea of water, because there's no more sea, as we read from John, of uh, Revelation, from, from John, written by John in chapter, uh, I believe, 21 or 20. But this is a, like basically a very crystal uh, place. You can imagine a large um, crystal covered um, square or large space like sea, um, and that's what John sees here. And in, in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in the back. Now there are four creatures around this throne of God. And the four creatures, who are they? They have full of eyes, front and back. Um, although they may not be omniscient like God is, they are able to see things with many eyes that they have front and back looking in all directions. But see, um, look at verse 7 and let's have a look at um, what they are in verse 7 and 8. The first living creature was like a lion, second like a calf, and third like face like a man, and fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. But they all have different appearances. First it's like lion, calf, man, and eagle. And they kind of um, remind us of all these Old Testament um, graphical um, dreams that Daniel had, all kinds of animals. And also in verse 8, the four living creatures, each having six wings. Now six wings also gives us, give us, uh, us a hint, because Isaiah saw angels with six wings, or four of eyes around and within, so they can see things, and they do not rest day or night, but they say, holy Holy, holy, Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Which is exactly what we find also in Isaiah chapter 6. Holy, holy, holy. Now these are the cherubims or angels. These four living creatures. They are living. And they look like lion, calf, and man, and eagle. They all... Um, have certain meanings. Lion is an animal that, that is like the king, power. And calf is just a little um, baby cow, which um, can also give us an impression of submission and humble service. And man, just rational being, um, able to articulate thought and logical, and flying eagle, 
very swift and fast, and also the king of flying creatures. So these angels appear in different ways, and they will come to play in later chapters as they execute judgments at the command of God. So we'll put that aside for now, but they are the angels. And they sing without rest, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. If you have those study Bibles with right indentations and parag paragraph breaks, you will see that there are five or so songs in chapter 4 and chapter 5. This is the first one. You will see another one in chapter, uh, chapter 4, verse 11. Another song comes in chapter 5, verse 9 and 10. Um, and also another one comes in, in verse um, 12. And also the last one comes in verse 13. Now these are all songs that, um, that angels actually sing or, or say. There's no specific mention of them singing, but they say these things and they say about God um, to praise God and to give glory and to worship God. That's interesting also because it says, look at verse 8, at the end um, of that paragraph before the Holy, 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 it says, saying. Angels say things. Look at verse 10, at the end of verse 10, it also says, saying, you are worthy, O Lord. You'll see also in chapter 5, verse 9, it says, they, are, uh, they, are, they sang a new song, but they say, saying. Words are important, but also they say rather than singing. And also you'll see the same um, in verse 12, in verse 13, they say things. It's interesting that um, if you look at the Bible carefully, angels don't really sing much, they say things. We, we think that angels sing because we sing uh, hymns and songs that say that, but it, the Bible says that they say things. It's more important what they say than the tunes they sing. So we have these angels saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God Almighty, who is and is and is to come. This is the, the nature of God. This is basically worship that never ends. And then in verse 9, whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, God, who lives forever and ever, that's easy, under, easy to understand, uh, the 24 elders, the church, fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. So you can imagine that whenever these angels say these things, the 24 um, elders come off from their thrones and fall down before God and worship the Lord God together. And they cast their crowns, verse 10, before the throne, again saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. There was nothing that was not created without him. Everything was created through him and by him. And therefore you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, honor, and power. So what do we see in chapter 4? In chapter 4, we see that the Lord is in control. He is sovereign and he rules the world actively. And the response from us, the response of the elders, is to fall down before him and worship him, to worship him. There is absolute peace and security knowing that God is in control, no matter what happens. That's reassuring. And that ought to drive out all anxiety. If you trust in God, if you believe in him, no matter what happens, Whatever the world is going through, we can, be, we can rest, rest assured knowing that God is controlling and ruling this world with his sovereign power. And we worship him. So what John sees is this. After the seven churches, he is transported to heaven. He sees in heaven that God is ruling. You can say that this applies, in, in fact, throughout the history of the world, isn't it? I mean, we saw that even in Isaiah chapter 6, that God is ruling from his throne. Isaiah saw that many thousands of years ago in the Old Testament times. And John sees that about 2,000 years ago from now, 
And we can also kind of see out with our spiritual eyes that God is in control and He's ruling from His throne. This is what's happening throughout the world history, whenever that may be. So this is almost timeless truth that God is sovereign ruler of this world and He is worthy to receive glory, power, and honor because He created all these things. Because He has created this world, He has the power and authority to control this world and that's exactly what John sees. It doesn't matter whether the world is going through some tribulation. It doesn't matter whether the world is almost being destroyed and almost all humanity is annihilated. Still, God is in control. That's one absolute truth that will anchor your faith, whatever happens in your life and around you in the world. Even though you're in some tragic situations, you know that God is still the sovereign ruler of this world. We cannot emphasize enough. Of the truth. Now, continuing on with chapter 5, he, he continues on. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne, so on the right side of God, or on his right hand, there was a scroll written inside and on the back. Now, you know that in the olden days they did not have books, they had scrolls. They either take uh, the leather um, scroll or sometimes papyrus and they roll. Usually they roll from both sides and then they make it into rolls and, and that's the scroll. The Bible was written on these scrolls and if you've seen those ancient scrolls like book of Isaiah um, it's a huge scroll rolling from both ends and you can kind of um, uh, wind uh, on one end and unwind on the other end and you can kind of go through the scroll and read through the Bible. He saw a scroll in God's right hand. It is written inside and also on the back. It's almost like um, printing on double side, printing double side, um, writing inside and also on the outside. We don't know what's written on this scroll just yet. But he says in verse 2, Then I saw a strong angel, no, not just angel, strong angel, proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to lose its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it because it's sealed. In the, in the ancient um, Roman world, important documents were sealed. Because obviously, um, you, know, you could have fraud and people could change things. So when you write a contract or when you write a will, if you're a rich and important person, you would write your will. Sometimes you exchange contract to buy and sell things or go into some sort of agreement. You write that in the, in the scroll. And then you roll it and you seal it. And if you know anything about the ancient sealing method, you, you melt wax and you Place, uh, you, you pour those um, wax, you drop those wax, liquid molten wax, on the documents where the seams come together, and you basically put your seal um, that has inscription of your initial, your, your name, or some symbols, and then you press it down so that it actually sticks those documents. And it also has the picture of your, your logo. It's almost like having your own, um, own, own logo and your seal, like a crest, um, and no one can open that. Only authorized people could open those seals. And once the seal is broken, you know that the document has been tampered with. So they used to seal the document to make it secure. Now here it says there are seven seals. You might see sometimes a picture with scrolls on either end and then seven seals all straight in one line. That may, be, uh, that may not be the accurate representation of this one here because it says that these seals, if you keep reading, um, chapter 6 and onwards, these seals are opened one by one. And as one each seal, each seal is opened, there is a certain message there. So you can't open all these seals all at once. And um, if you have all the seals in, in one line, then you have to open all the seals in order to open the whole scroll. But here it says, in fact, if you look at verse um, 2, it says, who is worthy to, first of all, open the scroll and to lose its seal. So you, you open a little bit and then you lose the seal and you open a little bit and you lose the seal and so on. So this scroll has been sealed um, 
by seven seals in, in sort of um, in, in consecutive order. So you kind of roll a little bit and then seal. You roll a little bit and then seal. You roll a little bit and seal. You roll a little bit and seal. And in that way, you have seven seals that has sealed this document. This roll, uh, this scroll is in the right hand of God. But the problem is, this strong angel, even the strong angel can't open it, who is worthy to open the scroll and lose its seals? In order to open this, this scroll and open the seal, um, lose the seal, this person has to be worthy. This person has to be qualified. In fact, um, this can only be opened by someone who has complete authority over this world, which only leaves one, the Creator Himself. The Creator. But God is now sitting on the throne with this scroll. And the angel says, who can open this scroll and lose its seals? And there's no one who's worthy. So in verse 4, at least for the time being, for a while, it says, John, um, I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. He wept. He wept. In a sense, he was really... Um, Excited, he, he, he was exuberant when he saw the throne of God, all the gemstones and the glory that exudes from that throne. 24 elders sitting on the thrones and ruling with crowns. This is amazing sight. And he's now becoming very excited and expectant and thinking that surely someone can open this scroll and continue on with the rule of God. When no one could do that, he was completely disappointed. So much so that he became so sad that he wept much. He wept much. But in verse 5, it was only for a little time, one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, which is a title for Messiah, the Root of David, another title for Messiah Jesus Christ, has prevailed to open the scroll and to lose its seven seals. That was a comforting thought, wasn't it? Or truth. The God is a scroll. No one can open the scroll, but Jesus Christ can. One of the elders tells John. And I looked in verse 6. And behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, the angels, and in the midst of the elders, so in the midst of all these things that he saw, the throne, the thrones, the elders, the, the angels, stood a lamb as though it, has, it had been slain, having seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God. Another expression for the spirit of God sent out into all the earth. So there's the lamb standing. It's a lamb, but not just any lamb, lamb that was slain, slain by the judgment of God on the cross. Jesus Christ is shown as the lamb slain. In fact, it says much later in Revelation, the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world because it was in the plan of God from before the foundation of the world. And he has the spirit of God. So we have even a picture of Trinity here. The Father God sitting on the throne. Jesus Christ, the Lamb standing. And the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ is with Jesus Christ. John sees all three in the same scene. He is now encouraged because the Lamb stands there and he can open the scroll. Look at verse 7. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. So he is now worthy to open the scroll. He takes the scroll out of the right hand of God, on the throne, sitting on the throne. And as soon as that happens, as um, the scroll is now on, in the hands of Jesus Christ. This happens. Look at verse 8. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures 
and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. So they come off from their thrones. They fell down before God, prostrate before God, the Lamb, Jesus Christ, each having a harp and a golden balls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. So what we don't know for sure, here is an interpretation. The, the balls, the golden balls full of incense, um, you, you can imagine golden balls. You might recall perhaps seeing some Catholic mass and sometimes priests have these golden balls and at the end of the, the chain, you know, they swing these balls and inside are incense with smoke coming out. So it's a golden ball. Each elders have these golden balls with incense inside. What's, what, is, what, is, what is this? It says it is the prayers of the saints throughout the church history. The prayers of Christians are now um, compared or described as the golden bowls with incense inside. But before that, each elders having a harp each. The harp is also a very familiar instrument in the Bible, harp and trumpet. Um, and all these instruments appear in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Um, and harp is also associated not only with praising God and singing and playing music before God, but also harp is associated with prophecy. If trumpet is associated with some sort of announcement, um, then harps, harp is associated with giving prophecy. When harp is played, um, prophets would prophesy and the Spirit of God would be moving. Um, so elders have harp and golden bowls full of incense and this is what they do. They fall down before God. Of course they play and pluck the harp and they may swing uh, the golden bowls, um, prayers of the saints, and they sang a new song. New song because John had never heard of this and they say this. You are worthy to take the scroll. And to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood, out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. It's a little bit like verse 11, but it builds on a little bit. You are worthy, O God, in verse 11, to receive glory, power, and honor, because he created all these things. But here he says, you are worthy now to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain. In other words, he has, the Lamb has the authority to open the scroll, break the seal, and read, and look, look, and read what is written in the scroll. And whatever is written in the scroll will happen. He has the power and authority to execute what is written on the scroll. So these elders and the four creatures sang a new song and they say, you are worthy to take the scroll, to open seals. And uh, you can also um, execute judgments according to scrolls. Out of every tribe and tongue and people of nation, you have redeemed us to God by your blood. Notice also in verse 9, in the middle, in that song or in that saying, it says, you are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals, for you were slain. In other words, they could do that. we could do that because he was slain. Because you were slain, you are worthy to take the scroll. In verse, um, previous, um, so in verse 11, chapter 4, you are worthy because you created this world. Here you are worthy to take the scroll because you were slain. Let's think about this. In order to take the scroll, open the scroll, and lose the seal, you had to be worthy. The Lord had to be worthy. How? Not just by being the creator, but he had to be the redeemer, which means he had to die and shed his blood. And that only makes sense because if you look at this scroll, the scroll contains all kinds of judgments. From chapter 6, you will see every time a seal is opened, terrible things happen in this world, the judgment. So this is basically God is judging the world without any reservation. His full wrath and indignation is poured out in full strength to the people in this world. 
But before God could judge the world and punish these unbelieving world, he had to save people. I mean, you, you couldn't judge the world without saving. God couldn't just go and judge people without redeeming those people who would believe in him. So salvation must come first before the judgment comes. And that's why Jesus said to the disciples when they said, shall we ask the fire to come down from heaven and destroy this village because they did not receive them? Jesus said, no. It's not that time of judgment yet. If that were the case, then how will the prophecies and scriptures be fulfilled? And how would people be saved? God gives opportunity to be saved first before he wills the sword of judgment. So here, in order to execute the judgments in the scroll, Jesus had to do the work of redeeming first. Save his people from all nations, all tribes, all tongues, from all peoples, from everywhere in the world. He had to redeem and secure his people through salvation. And only then would he be worthy and qualified to open the scroll. But here he is worthy to take the scroll because he has done that. So in order to open the scroll, he had to be the creator with all the authority to control the world. He also had to die and redeem his people through his blood so that the redemption takes place first before the judgment can come after. And that's why here he says, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain, because you have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe, tongue, people, nation, and you made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign with you on the earth. Also, a kind of hint for the millennium kingdom and the rule of Jesus Christ and Christians on the earth. And that's why if you look at, for example, John's Gospel in chapter 5, verse 22, the Father God has given all authority to judge to the Son. The Father himself does not judge, but he has given the authority to judge to the Son. Why? Because the Son is the Redeemer. Because the Son was sent as peace offering, sacrifice, to save us. That's why specifically the Son has the power to judge because he has done the work of saving people and only then can he judge the unbelieving world. He is the only one with the authority. Whatever happens in this world, he has the authority. He has the redeeming power. And if you are in him, in his hands, then you're safe. So look at verse um, 11. And then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne. Now, not just four, but many more angels. The living creatures. Now, these angels are also living creatures, like the four um, creatures. Um, and also, it refers to the, the four living creatures here, actually. Many angels, the living creatures, and the elders. And... He says the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000, of course, referring to these myriads of angels, and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice. Possibly this refers to also Christians, because the 24 elders refer to, uh, 24 elders represent all these Christians in the church. So the number of all these angels and humanity, redeemed humanity, that are saying this, praising um, God, God is numerous. Tens of thousands and thousands of thousands, um, just numerous, numerous. They say this with a loud voice. Imagine that. Imagine that. Not just humans, but angels also saying this together. Have you heard um, a large crowd shouting? Now, we live in a place where we are pretty close to the, the Olympic Stadium. Whenever there is a large gathering like football match or some sort of concert, we hear the, the, the crowd cheering and shouting from a distance. And it, it can be quite noisy. Imagine you're in the middle of those crowd, 
and you are hearing and even shouting together with these tens of thousands of people, the noise can be deafening. It could be even shaking, earth shaking. You don't just hear the sound, you feel the noise. Imagine that and multiply that by thousands and ten thousands, tens of thousands. Not only that, angels, even the strong angel. Angels that can speak perhaps like thundering. And all these elders redeemed humanity saying with a loud voice, that will be something to hear. That will be something you can never forget. And this is what they say, worthy, look at verse 12, the rest of the verse 12, it says, worthy is the lamb who was slain. He's worthy because he was slain to receive power, riches, and wisdom, and strength, and honor, and glory, and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven, and on the earth, and under the earth, and such as are in the sea, and all that are in them, I heard saying, Blessing, and honor, and glory, and power be to him who sits on the throne, the Father God, and to the Lamb, the Son of God, forever and ever. He says, living creatures, angels, in verse 11. Well, here in verse 13, it seems to be saying all kinds of creatures, animals, birds, and fish, every creature which is in the heavens, which is in heaven, and on the earth, and under the earth, such as are in the sea, and all that are in them. Basically all living creatures that have breath. They say this together. What an amazing chorus that must be. It's not just massive choir. It's not like 600 people choir. If you have heard of a large choir like that, you know how it is. It's the massive humanity, redeemed humanity, angels, even all these creatures of God coming together and saying this together. Just turn with me, I put a bookmark here, and turn with me to Romans for a minute here. I'll show you something very interesting. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. I'll read from verse um, 20. I'll read first from verse 19. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. It's saying that the creation is waiting for the appearance of the sons of God. In other words, revealing of the sons of God. In other words, the creation is waiting until Christians are glorified. See that? Are you a son of God if you're a Christian? Now, you know, spiritually, there's no gender, so son of God applies to both male and female. If you are saved, you are a son of God, yes? But has it been revealed that you are a son of God in kind of visible manifestation? No. You're saved, nothing changes. Yesterday, you're unsaved. Today, you're saved. You still have two eyes and one nose and two ears and one mouth. You still have two legs and two arms, ten fingers and ten toes. Nothing changes physically. But there will be a time when it will be revealed. In other words, the fact that you are a son of God will be visibly shown. When? At the time of glorification. And the creation is waiting for that. So you look outside, look at the trees, look at the animals. Even look at your own pet dog or cat. What are they waiting for? They are waiting for our revealing as the sons of God. Look at verse 20. Because the creation was subject to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Now they are subjected to the futility like us. They live uh, only a finite time because of the fall, because of sin. God punished and cursed this world. Um, so he did it even though they did not want that, in a sense, the animals are innocent victims of the fall, isn't it? And they did not do this willingly, 
but God subjected them to futility. But in hope, there's a hope. That's what they're waiting for. In verse 21, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Whatever form this may take, we don't know exactly what it might be like, but it says the creation itself is also going to be delivered from the bondage of corruption, sin and the curse and the fall, into the glorious liberty of the children of God. When we are liberated from this sinful flesh, from the bondage of sin, the creation will also be liberated from that into the glorious liberty of the children of God. So the effect of the fall will be removed. In verse 22, for we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs, pain, together until now. That's a very interesting thought, isn't it? All these creation of God creatures will be redeemed in some ways. Now they don't have sin like humans have, so they do not need salvation like we do need salvation. But in a sense, there will be a time when all this creation will be restored to a kind of pre-fall status. And they are waiting for that. They are waiting for that. The creation is waiting for that. Go back to Revelation chapter 5. So in verse 13, and every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the, earth, under the earth and such as are in the sea, and all that are in them I heard saying, now the creation will say this to blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. And rightly so, because they were created by God and they want to have that chance to praise God and to worship God and say this without any effects of sin. This will happen. So this is not just chorus from the redeemed humanity. There are angels. There are also creation of God, all creatures. And what does that mean? It means all created beings. You look at the Genesis, God created all these animals, fish and birds, and then men. Before that, God had already created angels. All these created beings come together and worship God and say this, blessing, honor, glory, power, be to him who sits on the throne and to, he, to the Lamb forever and ever because he is worthy. Look at verse 14. Then the four living creatures said, Amen. I mean, what more can you say? When the creation is praising God with this kind of wonderful doxology, all we can do, the 24 angels, uh, 24 elders, even four living creatures, angels, all we can do is to say Amen. The living creatures say Amen. 24 elders fell down and worshipped Him who lives forever and ever. So what John sees is a kind of timeless picture of God ruling the world and eventually all creature together with the redeemed humanity will come together and praise God and say, worthy are you Lord. Blessing and honor and glory and power be to you Lord. They say this with a loud, loud voice to the slain Lamb, the Son of God, to the God who is sitting on the throne. Can you burst into this kind of rapturous praise as the Lamb gets ready to carry out the judgments in the scroll? Because that's what's just about to happen. They are seeing this praise not merely because the Lord is worthy of this praise, Yes, of course, that is true. But they are singing this praise and they are saying these things because he is about to open the seals. 
And that means he's about to pour out judgments on this world. He's about to punish unbelieving world with all kinds of plagues as written in the scroll. And yet, the creation, the redeemed humanity, and the angels do not seem to have any pity or sympathy for this unbelieving world, but they say, Amen. And they burst into this rapturous praise. That's the response that is fitting even from us. So what do we see here in chapter 4 and chapter 5? Now, before we get into the actual action from chapter 6, John sees the throne of God. God is in rule. Uh, God is ruling the world from that, that throne, sitting on the throne. He is actively ruling and the Lamb comes to him and takes the scroll with seven seals. Inside the scroll are all the judgments that will unfold from chapter 6 and onwards. No one's worthy to open that scroll, but the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb slain, is worthy, and he's about to open the scroll after having taken it from the right hand of God. And he controls everything in this world. He has all the, the authority, authority to judge, and power, and honor, and glory. And John sees that. Now, how do you think this might have made John feel? I mean, he's overwhelmed. I mean, he's seeing this heavenly vision, which is out of this world. Nothing like anything he has ever seen before. He sees this, and I'm sure that he felt like Daniel when God showed some vision to him. He fell down as dead for a while. And John might have done that too. He sees this, but at the same time, yes, the, the actual vision is overwhelming. But on the other hand, in his mind and in his heart, there is peace and security. Because he knows that God is in control. The very loving, gracious God who sent Jesus Christ to save us from sin and redeemed us from this world. That very Savior and our Father is the one who is in control of all these things. And if that's how you feel, then you are together with John and what is your response we ought to sing these songs together we ought, we ought to say the same things um, together with these angels and the 24 elders saying the holy 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 you are almighty God you are worthy you deserve all praise and you receive glory honor and power and all honor and glory be to you. This is how we ought to respond. And as we do that, we have hope, peace, and security. We are reassured in our mind and heart. Until such time when we live together with Jesus in eternity. Just one last thing to think about. If that's how you feel and if that's how you, you respond to this truth, you have hope and peace in you, and you know that eventually we will enjoy that peace and hope when it's realized in full in eternity, then how does that shape my life now? Turn to First Peter chapter 3 and let's end with this verse. First Peter chapter 3. When you look at the world and Revelation, it's almost like what's happening in Revelation is happening now, or at least some sort of prologue of that. So the people are insecure, they are afraid, and they're, they're fearful. But we Christians know that God is in control, so we are hopeful and we are peaceful. So if you feel the kind of hope, and if you understand the kind of hope, and if you enjoy the kind of hope and peace, look at chapter 3, verse 15. This is what we can do in First Peter. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense or answer to everyone who asks you a reason for what? The hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Do you have hope? Do you have peace? 
And if you do, then people will come and ask you, why? I'm scared because of coronavirus. I'm fearful because of this and because of that. I'm concerned because the world is going to be very different from now. I'm afraid there might even be a third world war. People can talk about that and be concerned and be anxious about this. And as for us, we feel hopeful, peaceful. We have comfort in Christ because we know that He has full control of this world. The time is up to Him, whenever that may be, when He comes and does this judgment. But we know that He is in control and He will do what is right. He never gets anything wrong, so we can have complete trust and faith in Him. So when you have the kind of hope, then people will find you strange. They'll think you're either nuts or you have some anchor in your life. So they might come and ask you, how come, you know, why? You don't seem to be concerned as much. You don't seem to be worried or fearful as much. That's your cue to share your faith with them. So be ready, be ready in season and out of season to tell them the reason for the hope that is in you. That's how we can live our life now. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this teaching from your word. What we have seen in chapter 4 and chapter 5 in Revelation is beyond our comprehension. And it was beyond the descriptions that John could come up with. It seems that he used um, every vocabulary and employed all kinds of expressions that he could use to convey what he had seen to us on paper. But still, it is nothing compared to the real sight. But whatever he has seen, he has communicated to us that you are in control and you are the sovereign ruler and the Lamb, Jesus Christ, the slain Lamb, is the only worthy one to open the seals. And we know that even before you execute these, these judgments, we can see that we can be, uh, we, we can be peaceful and com find comfort in you because we know that you are in control. You will never lose control. And Lord, at the same time, knowing these things and having the hope um, means that we live our lives differently from the people of this world. And as we do that, we might get inquiries from these people and we might have opportunities to testify the Lord Jesus Christ and witness the gospel of Jesus Christ. May we be ready for that, Lord, in our daily lives, to people around us, people whom we meet with. May we engage in these conversations. Give us your wisdom, Lord, so that we would be able to bring this truth to them in, um, in, in, a, in the best way possible. Lord, we pray that you will give us opportunities and circumstances in which you can share the faith and make us prepared and ready so that we can share this truth with people. And it is our desire, Lord, to see more people come to salvation through our ministry. Do this for your glory, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.